There is no debate that digital affects the way we work. The question is, should we fear this transformation or should we embrace it? Mikhail, maybe we should start with an example. Do you know what knocker uppers are? Ralitza, I have to be honest, of course I do not. Neither did I <laughs> until I watched a British professor, Diana Cole, talk about the future of work. And what she said, she talked about knocker uppers, who were people who would go around waking people to go to work before the alarm clocks took their jobs away. So this is what raises fears today about the future of work and technology. And then, Mihai, she also talked about ATMs and how these inventions actually helped make the tellers' jobs better. Yeah, I bet, because they had more time not to count money anymore, but to advise people how to make more money, right? That's right, Mihai. So, now, this session is really about making sure that Digital for Jobs will follow the teller, the ATM scenario, not the knocker-upper one. Therefore, we have brought together academics, business and labor leaders to make sure that we shouldn't fear the future just because we don't know it. And after all, it's up to us to shape our future. And we will hear from experts with concrete ideas and recommendations. But before we do that, before we dive into uh, discussions, let's watch a video. The future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. Our societies are changing. So is the world of work. Some of these changes will not be easy. The digital transformation offers opportunities, new jobs and industries, increased productivity, improved public services, a boost for lagging regions, and Europe's continued status as an economic powerhouse. The digital single market strategy and the European pillar of social rights support job creation, competitiveness and access to fair and inclusive labour markets. There are challenges too. Major gaps in digital skills, insufficient protections for platform workers, health and safety in the digital workplace. We cannot wait and see. We must lift up the workforce with 21st century education systems and lifelong digital re- and upskilling include women promoting their skills and education and advocating for more female entrepreneurs ensure the european social model is sustainable for current and future generations work together across eu countries sectors and generations Business as usual is not an option. The future of work is now. Right, so we are pressed uh, between um, unsolved challenges from the past and the challenges from the future. I think it's time to invite our keynote speaker, Ralitza. That's right, Mihai. He is a professor of economics and governance at Utrecht University and the former chair of the high-level expert group on the impact of the digital transformation on EU labor markets. Martin Hoss, welcome to the stage. Thank you. It's um, an honor to be here. Thank you for the introduction. I have 10 minutes, so I'm going to focus on some of the main insights about the impact of digitalization on work, on labor markets, that we have uh, recently uh, developed. So how do I switch slides? Yep. 
So the first main insight is that digitalization is having a very profound impact on work, on labor markets, but also that it's not the only driver of change in labor markets. There's also globalization, our institutions, regulation, labor market policies are continuously changing. And in advanced economies, there's a slowdown in population growth and workforce aging. And each of these trends, and specifically how each of these trends interact, is having or resulting in a very specific impact on our world of work, on labor markets. And I think that realizing that there's more trends that in, in the way that they interact have a specific impact on labor markets, I think realizing that is a first step towards uh, sound policy making. The second big insight is that we should focus on facts. Facts matter. We should uncover more facts and get those facts out there. And this slide illustrates some of the facts that we um, have uncovered. Um, and that are to some extent also known uh, more broadly. The first fact is that technological progress and digitalization is a driver, if not the most important driver, of increases in living standards in the long run. I think that's a fact that most of us are uh, familiar with. A second fact that maybe some people are less aware of is that digitalization, so the process of digitalization itself uh, is actually increasing total employment in advanced economies by about 0.5% a year. So what that means is that for the EU28, digitalization itself is increasing total employment by over 1 million jobs each year. Of course, there's jobs disappearing, but there's more jobs that are being created, and in net, there's an increase in total employment of about 1 million jobs in the EU 28. And that's a fact that we've uncovered, but that is also a fact that really goes against, uh, very much against kind of the, 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 the popular beliefs that people have that digitalization could be leading to uh, mass job destruction and mass unemployment. And so getting you know, these facts out there is, is really important. Um, as well. And then a third fact is that new work arrangements offer opportunities for workers uh, and companies. So by new work arrangements I mean workers not employed full-time and in permanent jobs, but this could be part-time workers, agency workers, contract workers, um, or um, self-employed or freelancers. We've seen a rise in those more flexible types of work arrangements. And what we also know, for example, if you look at the gig economy, which is the online labor market for tasks, if you look at the gig economy, in terms of employment, it's still relatively small. Less than 1% of total employment is in the gig economy, but it's growing exponentially. And a lot of that growth in jobs in the gig economy is actually taken up by people who would otherwise not have had jobs. So again, you know, that's the fact that we've recently uncovered and that is important in um, including in um, our policy designs. So in some, you know, facts matter, we should uncover more facts um, and get those facts out there, whether they're good uh, or bad. That's the second main insight that um, I wanted you to take away from uh, this speech. And then finally, of course, there's also challenges. And um, I won't have time to go into a very specific uh, set of, of policy recommendations during my speech. We've written um, this report with a high-level expert group. Um, we've written this report and there's actually two members of the group present here today, Professor Maria Savona. Maria, where are you there? Uh, and Gary Shaughnessy. So if you still have questions left after this plenary session, uh, ask me or uh, ask Maria or Gary about specific policy recommendations. Also, Andrea Renda from SEPS and Andrea Glorioso from DG Connect have organized a number of workshops over the last couple of months. Um, and they also know a lot more about the specific policy recommendations um, that I don't have time for to talk about today. So also please talk to them if you are left with questions after this plenary session. 
So what I'm going to do is, if, we, if it comes to policy challenges, I'm going to talk about three main policy domains. And the first policy domain, so these, these are kind of policy domains that pop up um, whenever we have discussions about what's the impact of digitalization on uh, labor markets. The first policy domain are skills. So you know, again, if, if the main impact of digitalization would be mass unemployment, today we would be talking about unemployment insurance, we would be talking social security, but we're not. We're talking about skills. And the reason is that you know, the main concern is not mass unemployment, but the main concern is that there's many jobs that are disappearing, but at the same time, there's many jobs that are created or more jobs that are created but they require different skills, they require different competencies. And how do we make sure that people are stay employable also uh, in the future? And there's a number of key insights that we have recently developed when it comes to skills. The first one is the question, what skills? Uh, of course, we know that STEM skills are important. So STEM is science, technology, engineering, and math. But we also know, for example, that the best way to use STEM skills is in combination with good social skills. So the most successful workers with STEM degrees are those workers that also have very strong social skills. So it's not just a question of investing in STEM, it's also a question of other non-cognitive skills um, that are important for, for us humans in the labor market when we collaborate or work with uh, new technologies. So that's the question of what skills. The second question regarding skills is who should invest in skills and how can we incentivize workers, employers, companies, as well as maybe third parties, public or private, to jointly invest in the accumulation of skills but then also share the benefits of uh, that investment. And I think one of the main insights here is that we should try to organize those incentives relatively close to the workplace where we have a good indication of what specific skills are required at the workplace level. A third insight is also that we can focus those incentives towards specific groups of workers. For example, workers that are dismissed because of automation, or for example, get more women into STEM jobs because the data show that women with STEM jobs tend to perform better than men with STEM jobs, given that they tend to have better social skills on average. So that's the skills agenda. And I focused on um, the accumulation of skills for workers, but also keep in mind that companies have to keep learning, in large part through also the investments um, in uh, worker skills. So that's skills. The second policy domain that um, is very prominent in, in the debate, has to do with decent work. So the creation of quality jobs, and safeguarding worker well-being um, and life work balance. And let me give you two examples that also came up yesterday in the World Cafe that was organized in preparation of this plenary session. The first example is the possibility, the increased possibility for workers and companies to work remotely. So workers have an increased autonomy in choosing where to work. But often that increased autonomy in, in, in choosing where to work comes at a cost of less autonomy when to work because workers have to be reachable anywhere at any time. And you can think of policies for workers that allow workers to escape that trade-off. Another example that we talked about yesterday is the tech neck, which is an injury uh, a neck injury related to uh, working with computers on the job. And it's just an illustration. Um, and here questions are, for example, do we do enough to prevent tech neck injuries from happening? And once an injury realizes, once you have a tech neck, do we have sufficient recognition uh, of a tech neck as a um, work-related uh, injury? And um, I'm sure that the panel that will follow this, this, this speech will focus more on, on those types of questions. As a final note, a side note, when it comes to decent work, the, there's also other important question, questions that are asked in the policy domain of decent work, which are, which are important but are not directly related to digitalization. So for example, there's a very important debate about 
whether or not we should make our social security as neutral as possible to the type of contracts that people have, given that we have this rise in non-standard work arrangements. I'm not focusing on those debates here today because I don't think that digitalization is the only or the main um, cause of, of posing that challenge. Um, and I'm saying that as a side note because I think it's important as policymakers, either at private or public organization, to real to organizations to realize that digitalization is not the cause of all the challenges that are posed to us. And also, I think the challenges that will become more, most prominent in the near future are those challenges that are driven by more of the trends than I've discussed uh, in the beginning. So if you have several of these trends pushing in the same direction towards the same challenge, these are probably going to be the, the policy challenges that you want to tackle first um, as a public policymaker or in your organizations. And then finally, inclusion. I think in Europe we have a very strong history of having the institutions that result in an inclusive labor market. And the question is how can we make sure that we redesign our institutions such that our labor market remains inclusive in the future given digitalization and these other trends that uh, I mentioned. And so one example of a more specific question in this area is how should we redesign our social dialogue? Um, another question that popped up yesterday in um, the uh, World Cafe, um, and uh, you know, is, is, is a, I think also a broader concern, are regional disparities. So we see in Europe, for example, we see high-tech hubs, but we see also areas where, uh, that are less prosperous in terms of um, high-tech development. And this has been a concern, I think, for a while, but um, all, the, all the indications in the data show that this will remain a concern also in uh, the future. So that's just to give you some flavor, some background of the, the large policy domains that we have um, uncovered or identified over the past uh, years, and specifically the past 12 months. Um, and I hope that in the panel debate that will follow um, this, this, this short keynote, um, we will be able to dive a little bit deep, deeper into specific policies uh, in each of these domains. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Thank Host. You, very much, Professor. you have given us a lot of good talking points. I hope we can cover as much as possible. Now, I've taken out my uh, smartphone and most of you have it in your hands anyway. Uh, but there is no problem because I actually encourage you to do this. Go to Slido. Do you remember Slido from yesterday? The, the code for today for this session is digital for jobs. Just put that code in and you'll be able and you are invited to participate in our poll that uh, it's uh, ongoing already. Quite balanced so far. Uh, these are the ideas that emerged from the yesterday's workshop dedicated to digital for jobs and we need your answers, we need your opinions and throughout the day we need your questions and thoughts because this is how we shape the future of the EU policies in the next five years with the help of experts like you present to Digital Assembly 2019. So please start uh, voting and we'll get back to your answers later on. That's right. And now we will start our panel discussion after those great talking points from Professor Hoss. Uh, it's time now to introduce our panelists. And first I'd like to ask Ms. Anya Monrad, Senior Vice President of Dell Technologies, Chair of the Governing Board of the Digital Jobs and Skills Coalition. Welcome. And we also invite Ms. Marie-Beatrice Leveau, President of the European Federation for Family Employment. Mr. Gary Shaughnessy, Chair of the Z Zurich Foundation, former member of the high-level expert group on the impact of the digital transformation on EU labor markets. Welcome to you as well. Mr. Adrian Hofer, Global Head of Digital Operations, the ADECO Group. Mr. Michne Kostoyu, Rector of the University of Politecnica of Bucharest. Dr. Umarani Amara, Senior Economist, United Nations International Labour Organization. Ms. Sarah Deush, Project Officer for Development and Strategy of SMART, Societe Mutuelle pour Artis. 
Welcome to you as well. And my first question will go to Mr. Shaughnessy. Mr. Shaughnessy, you follow the mid and long term risks. Welcome. Mr. Shaughnessy, you follow the mid and long term risks of the future of work. What should the European Union focus on specifically now to prepare for the future? Um, well, I think, I think the first thing echoes the points that Martin was making earlier, which is what we see is a huge polarization, actually, uh, in that for some, the digital technologies are incredibly liberating mm -hmm. uh, and enabling, and for other groups within our societies, actually they're disabling and uh, incre increasingly uncomfortable and increasingly creating change. The consequence of that and it's not just a digital delivery though, is that we are in a stress epidemic and the numbers are absolutely staggering. Uh, we see one in six adults will have a mental health condition in their adulthood. 240 million people worldwide uh, suffer from depression with a predominance to women. Uh, and the cost of uh, presenteeism and absenteeism in the European Union is approaching a trillion uh, euros per annum. So in terms of actions we think that need to be taken, uh, firstly, we believe there needs to be a duty of care on employers uh, to uh, enable and understand work-life balance and stress levels of their employees and to transparently communicate that so that uh, other employees uh, and consumers can see it. Uh, we also think there is a requirement on awareness and role modeling. There is a stigma around uh, mental health conditions and we've been working with Rugby Players Ireland uh, and the, to focus on young women and young men in Ireland and the impact has been enormous in terms of both awareness and willingness to talk and then take action, which leads to the, the third key issue for me, which is focus on prevention first and recovery second and the online tools that can help people manage their mental health and their, their, um, uh, their mental health condition on an ongoing basis can make a real difference and should be available on a broader basis to workers, not just employees, but within the gig economy and within networks. Okay, uh, we can see actually on Slido that your answer uh, really shaped the, the opinion of the audience. So uh, you are heard at least at Digital Assembly 2019, uh, Mr. Shaughnessy. Uh, I would ask now, uh, uh, Ms. Morad, uh, what's to be done to ensure uh, ways of access on the labor market in a future that digital skills will prevail? Yeah, I, I think um, I'll start with, with saying that I'm definitely a digital optimist, right? I, I believe that um, IT and digitalization is a force for good. It can be a force for good. It can drive human progress. And I think we, um, we tend to focus very much on, on the challenges and the issues, and I'm not trying to ignore those, but I think there's so many opportunities to use technology and, tech, uh, and digitalization to actually create inclusion in the workforce as well. Um, I think one of the things that technology can be used, and, uh, and, and Professor Martin mentioned that just before as well, is is the flexible work that you can create through technology. You can the flexible working hours, the flexible working places, the inclusion of, let's say, religious women that normally wouldn't join the workforce, um, the uh, opportunity to include caregivers and others into the workforce as well. And I think it's an obligation for us also to look at those sides of technology and see how can we actually use the technology to bring more. And there was mentioned as well, it creates more jobs than it actually um, dissolves. It's just different types of jobs. So talking about the skill set, it really is a skill set issue all around from be beginning in, in the school system. And one of the focus areas is really also to ensure that the young people are not just technology consumption users, but creators. 
and we also know that we are losing girls already in the school system. So starting with including um, and focusing on skills in the school system also for girls is going to be very, very critical to ensure that we're going to have women coming into the workforce way later. Um, one of the big uh, focus have really been around skills in manufacturing production works, but we see with AI that jobs like management, legal, um, accounting are also going to be influenced in the future. And a lot of the research that um, Dell have done as well with Institute for the Future shows that 85% of the jobs that we're going to have in 2030 are not even invented yet. So we can talk about skills and upskilling and reskilling, but one of the challenges is we don't really know what the jobs that we're going to be creating in the future are going to look like. So a lot of the focus should really be on learning on the fly, having those social competencies that Professor Martin spoke about as well, so that we can learn and we can engage in collaboration um, going forward. But we also see that most investments today go into AI rather than human intelligence. So there's a need of investing way more in training and, and skilling for, um, for everyone. And one of the things that um, the Digital um, Skills and Job Coalition have focused and, and have um, recommended in the action plan that we've put together is really to create a skills week just like there was a code week for young people in school system, to create a skills week so that we can demystify some of the skills that are going to be needed in the future and have that um, be around Europe. Oh, that's quite interesting. Yeah, you mentioned social skills. You um, also talked about uh, uh, family workers. And that takes me to my question to uh, Ms. Laveau. I'd like to ask her about um, this uh, so-called undeclared invisible work. Uh, Ms. Laveau, uh, you deal with the less visible parts of the labor market, such as the home and the family workers that are so important. How can digital technologies help to professionalize uh, and combat this kind of undeclared work? A lot of this is quite undeclared. Merci. Je vais parler en Thank you very much. I'll be speaking in French. Indeed you shouldn't leave anyone behind. And I think the subjects that were dealt with since yesterday just go to show, go to show the importance of looking at all of those that work in the home. So 8 million people in the EU work from home. That's 4% of total jobs. In the EU as well, we're talking about 91% um, of women, so one out of uh, 13 women work at home, so they work from home. And so the idea is to encourage employment of women. So we need to look at employment of women, for example. You have things like uh, childcare. You have uh, people who are aging at home as well. So those are very interesting aspects. So what's the major challenge? The major challenge is to declare these wages so that people have access to decent work. So this will allow decent work. It will allow a certain amount of social rights. People need to be visible. And that's the real challenge in this sector. We need to make the invisible visible. And all of that goes via the capacity in member states to create um, a way of declaring things digitally, declaring your work digitally. And we know that in some member states you can allow some families who are able to declare their salary on a platform, an administrative platform. And that's uh, something that really is a challenge. Now, for a number of countries, there are going to be 45%, so in Germany, for example, 45% of uh, these jobs are going to be, f uh, and in Italy, you're talking uh, about a significant number as well, as well as the Netherlands. So this is something that is very much a boon for less qualified people, but it uh, is a challenge as well. We need to encourage best practices. Now, beyond the digital impact, uh, 
what we need to do is, in each member state, we need to create a means to simply declare your income from home. So this will allow people to be visible and allow them to access social rights. Then what we need to focus on is professionalization. We're talking about jobs that need to evolve. We need to ensure that we allow people to access professionalization so we can do this digitally. But what we don't really focus on is change of use. And we need to allow that through um, digital means. So quite a number of uh, European citizens need to access new tools. For example, e-health. You've got aging is a major challenge. You're going to have robots who are going to aid people at home. So that's a massive development. So one of the challenges is we have a challenge for the people themselves, and then we have a challenge in terms of use, in terms of the new jobs that are going to appear for all of those jobs, those jobs that were up until now considered to be unskilled jobs. So those are the essential points I wanted to deal with. So um, there are projects that I think DG Connect need to get involved in. And for example, one of these projects would be about active aging. We need to uh, have programs on active aging. And also, I believe that what we need to do is we need to look at connected homes. That's a vital point as well. That's going to be a vital point in uh, transforming daily lives, the daily lives of our citizens. Thank you. Madame uh, I think, Ralitza, we already see two branches of this talk. How we, the ones that already work for some time, prepare and adapt to the digital age, and how we prepare the young ones to be better equipped right. for the digital age. And I'm looking now at Professor Kostoyu, mm -hmm. and I'm asking him, you are also the director of the uh, European Te Technological Universities Association, CESAR, right? When you gather there. You're, you're, you're talking what? How are you going to prepare the young ones to be better providers for old ones in the future in a digital society? What are the, the directions that we should take? <clears throat> Thank you so much uh, for the invitation. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, we work in, uh, in Romania and in all the European Union with a uh, young citizen, a young uh, colleague in my opinion. I talk in, my, in front of our students with this, with this message. We are colleagues now. We work in the same direction. We work in the technical university, but not only. It's very important, uh, it's very important to talk about the digitalization, not only in universities is the first idea. It's necessary to talk in all societies. It's necessary to increase the, the culture of, uh, of digitalization in all levels, not only in university. It's very important this because the influence is not only from the uh, very the, the, the person with education, very high education, but in all level, uh, the dig digitalization have a very large impact. Second, I am also a digital optimist. Uh, I work in our country, in, in, uh, in my university, many years ago in that. I'm not very modest, sorry, I changed the perspective of our digitalization and I put in the table in front of society one new fiscal treatment for IT workers, very good university. Many years ago, can I speak about this, many person tell me you are crazy. Nobody's happened, nobody understand this, nothing has happened. But now 5% of our GDP is coming, more than 5% of our GDP is coming from IT sector. This is because we have very important two pillars. First, it's university, and very good human resources, and second, it's a very stable and very uh, good fiscal treatment. And I respond, to the, I respond now to the question. We, in our opinion, we need three, four, um, three, four uh, intersections. Digital competence, of course, and we know uh, starting from a framework such as DigiComp uh, framework. Second, 
very important for Euro European Union, very important in our opinion, the entrepreneurial competence. We know what's happened in the world, we know what's happened in Asia or United States. We continue to invest here in European Union more money for develop the market, also digital market, but our position is not same position last, I don't know, 20 years ago or 25 years ago. If we don't understand, and this is my very important message, if we, if we don't understand this very difficult world, economic world in this digital era, we transform Europe in the largest and famous museum in the world. It's, it's a not very optimistic message, but for this it's necessary to understand and put in the table in European Union in a new economic model. And for this it's necessary for our youngest in new, the entrepreneurial competence. Three citizenship competence. Uh, many colleagues speak about this. It's very important. Also the human rights, it's very important. We coming, I coming from university and we talk in university about the human rights, it's very important. And of course, social skills, uh, our colleague mentioned, I don't insist. Last but not least idea, uh, it's very important to put all effort across the European Union. Of course, it's uh, some, uh, in, in the Western part of Europe, it's very good economy. But we have in this part of Europe very strong university, very good companies, local companies, international companies now in Romania. And it's necessary to exchange our experience, not only repeat in one part of Europe, and put our effort in the same direction to realize very good economy in this part of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you. And let's expand this to uh, globally uh, with, with Ms. Amara. You represent the International Labour Organization. If we can share the mic, thank you. So what you, you have your eyes on the global trends, looking at Europe, what is your suggestion? What should Europe focus on, prioritize right now to prepare for the future? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. I think I'm gonna start along the same lines that Martin and Anya have been going, saying that, well, digital and digital platforms actually provide a lot of opportunities for workers both in terms of employment and also in terms of taking care of household care responsibilities because it provides flexibility. But there are two more things that are quite interesting to look at actually when you look at digital platforms. One was something that was alluded to yesterday that because of traffic congestion and commuting, many of the workers can actually use digital platforms. So there's a very good environmental side to it. And we've also found based on our own research that these platforms actually provide very good opportunities for workers who are physically challenged and who also have certain social anxiety problems. So there are a number of opportunities that are there, but at the same time, there are a number of challenges. And I think these challenges need to be addressed. And this is where I think Europe's social pillar rights need to actually look at. We are also of the opinion that technology can actually be harnessed quite effectively to address many of these challenges. The first one that I'd like to actually talk about is the low pay. Like many of the workers who work on these platforms, and this is not only from the work that we have done, but work internationally done across global workers, is that about more than 70% of the workers actually don't even get minimum wages. So this is a huge issue. And that is in Europe? Uh, even in Europe actually. In Europe, even if you took any particular platform, I don't want to name it, but if the platform goes about saying that you can earn about nine euros, the workers actually earn on an average about four euros, and about 70% of the workers earn less than the minimum wages. So this is a concern not only globally, but even for European country workers. So I think this is something one needs to keep in mind. Apart from that, the social security benefits or other benefits that these workers get are very, very low. And I think I differ a bit from what was said initially saying that we don't bring in social security here, but actually te technology can be harnessed very effectively to provide many of these benefits. So can we look at digital technologies in that way? The second issue which is linked to the first one or the challenge is related to the lack of transparency. 
So, you know, one of the major problems that we see is that there's no transparency in platforms with regard to who the worker or the client is. So nobody knows who they are. So as a result, when a worker is actually working on these platforms, if they have problems, they cannot actually effectively communicate. And the lack of transparency actually also extends to the algorithmic management, which actually controls the workers. And this could lead to both gender and regional discrimination. And this we have seen actually quite, there's a lot of evidence and findings with regard to it. Now the question that arises is, why do we have these challenges or problems? And part of it is related to the regulatory gap that you see. Because this is a very complex area, because you have a platform which actually operates from one country, you have clients from multiple other countries, and you have global labor pool. So the issue that comes up is, which jurisdiction do you actually apply? Yeah. So I think that's the crux, and that's where probably Europe needs to actually focus on. Towards this, we at the ILO have actually released the Global Commission report this year on future of work. And actually what we do is we do call for an international governance system, which very clearly sets and requires that the platforms and the clients actually respect some minimum rights and conditions for the workers. Now, this is not the first time. This is, there's been a precedence to this case, and the case has been that of the seafarers where we had the Maritime Labor Convention that came into force in 2006. So, you know, you have some very good examples which can be followed, and I think Europe can sort of start thinking along these lines and try to see what kind of regulations can be brought about. Actually, this lack of transparency uh, got my vote on the Slido uh, uh, question uh, that I put earlier. Please keep uh, continuing on voting because we are going to use your data uh, later on. I think uh, uh, Mr. Hofer here heard a lot of ideas that he can address and uh, you know, address from the perspective of a temporary work agency like ADECO Group. So uh, what's the key of success in a digital market uh, from your perspective, Mr. Hofer? Thank you for, the, for that question. I think Overall, I would see digital technology as opening up huge opportunities in, new, in a new world of, uh, of work that offers um, very different forms of work, be it uh, in a temporary way, in a permanent way, be it in, in freelance or any other shape or forms. And I would like to refer to the ATM example that you gave um, right at the beginning of that, uh, of that session. Uh, so technology in the end can help to make more jobs available, to make on-demand jobs available 24-7. I can apply to a job that is in my neighbor neighborhood um, that starts in two hours from now, and their digital technology really plays, uh, plays a role. Digital te technology can help verify people, making sure um, that people who have a right to work um, can go to work, and people who don't have a right to work um, will not be sent uh, illegally to work. Digital technology can also help um, our work is being paid instantly um, and not wait for a payroll process that is a very manual process and takes, uh, and takes for, for two weeks. So I think in terms of choice, in terms of speed, in terms of supporting many, many ways of work, um, there are a lot of opportunities in digital technologies. Um, I would not neglect challenges behind that and uh, I would like to start with the challenge that, that we have as, as a company ourselves. In the end, it, it also requires a huge transformation. Like, again, the ATM example, um, we are predominantly um, a branch-based network business that is very manual um, and not very standardized. So bringing our organization also up to speed, embracing digital technology and using digital technology for the, uh, for the good of our business, for the good of, of our candidates, uh, workers and of our clients, is a huge challenge. We have also that skills imbalance that we are um, often and rightfully uh, talking about. Um, so approaching that challenge for ourselves, um, that is not an easy task and is, is one that we are driving forward um, uh, quite, uh, quite urgently, um, of, co uh, of course, to make sure that in the end we develop uh, also capabilities to use digital technology um, in a good way to form an ecosystem of work that can really help also again to the ATM example, going away from being at the cash uh, tailor and handing out money to advise, to making sure that we play a more important role um, in our talents careers, uh, for example. So that is one challenge. Um, it's 
an interesting one, but it's, it's certainly a core challenge. And then we see a second challenge, and that is the challenge of our clients also transforming. Many of our clients, they also realize that they have, that they run into a huge skills imbalance and that we'll need to change that to be able to be competitive uh, going forward. That gives a whole new world of opportunities also, of, cor of course, for our business to help our clients transform themselves, to understand what skills uh, will be more in demand, to understand what these jobs are that we do not know um, they exist or they will exist uh, out there. So that is also a, a huge channel that, a challenge that is, uh, is faced out there. I think I would like to boil it down to, in the end, the topic of re and upskilling, which I think is, uh, is an absolutely essential element in that whole field. How can we make sure um, that we kind of move on in the world, that we use our talent and build on our talent to make sure that we are able to work with digital technologies um, uh, in the future, how we can make that offering. And, and we, we talk a lot about these topics, how we can also go beyond the question of how to finance re and upskilling. I think we also need to think about how can we design, how can we know what to upskill to, how can we advise, be it our clients or be it our candidates, how can we advise in the right way where to invest um, where to seek for, for these uh, upskilling uh, opportunities. Thank you. Uh, my next question would be to uh, Mr. Hirsch. You, listening to all of this, uh, the need to reskill workers, the need to uh, uh, respond to the new work arrangements, which offer a lot of opportunities, but they also offer a lot of challenges. From your point of view, uh, uh, what can be done? You, you are uh, in charge of a cooperative model, which is not very much understood. Could you explain to us how this cooperative model helps workers in the new economy? Uh, and uh, why should they use their services? What benefits can they get in the new economy uh, from what you have to offer them? You can pick up the mic. Yes. So, well, first of all, and I'll come to the smart model and the cooperative model. Um, to me, the digitalization is only accelerating and exacerbating what we've seen in the labor market in the last 30 years. Basically, the blurring of boundary between classical employment, uh, as we know it, full-time, open-ended contract, and the figure of the self-employed worker who is uh, well-off, um, who is a liberal profession, or uh, an employer. In fact, what we've seen in the last years is that 40% of the labor market is a typical employment in between those two figures. And the, f the type of worker that has increased the most is the one of the freelancer. So a freelancer is basically someone who has skills, who wants to make a living out of these knowledge and, and, and competences, but has to work with different clients. And what we see is that this figure, which is really in between uh, the classic employee and self-employed, is he needs both autonomy and solidarity. And this is what we see in the jobs that are created with the digitalization. They have a certain degree of autonomy. Now, autonomy can be declined in var various ways. You can be autonomous in the way you execute your work. You can be autonomous in the way you, uh, in your contracting relationships. You can be autonomous in choosing your working time and so on. So different variables of autonomy, and we have to be aware about that. But our social security models have been based on the fact that either you are a salaried worker and you need protection, or you're an autonomous worker and you're well off and you don't need social protection. And these yeah, figures... A very serious point. <laughs> <laughs> and these, uh, these atypical employments and these freelancers really trigger the fact that these workers, they need both. They need autonomy and they need protection. And this is exactly what we do. So as a, as a cooperative of freelancers, what we do is we provide the members with tools and services so that they can develop their economic activity. Because one of the problems for self-employed today is, if you look at the figures, the number of people who are self-employed and who are at risk or in poverty are booming. In Belgium, for example, one out of the six self-employed is, um, is in poverty, and two out of six are at risk of poverty. Otherwise, they could open up a company, but there too, we see the number of companies that close after two, three years because it's difficult to make a living. So what we allow them to do is to use our enterprise, our shared enterprise, to 
declare their economic activity, their contracts. Basically, we're dealing with paying tax benefits and so on. So they're just using plugging into our cooperative for their needs when they work. Because sometimes they work, sometimes uh, they don't. They have often multiple jobs too, and sometimes they have to juggle with different legal statuses. So basically we help them in this activity through an online platform. And we also provide them with a double solidarity. The first one is we take on the uh, role of employer and we give them the most protective status, which is the one of salaried workers. But because they're irregular income and not necessarily an open-ended contract, it can be difficult for them to access certain parts of social security. So there's a lot to do with social security. And the second aspect that we, uh, that protection that we provide them is the solidarity through the mutualization of means. Basically, all the benefits that we generate, we reinvest them in services for our members, be it training, we have guarantee fund, we pay our, our, our freelancers within seven working days, uh, working spaces, legal advice, and so on. And so I said, we have an online platform and we've bumped into platform workers um, a few years ago because we realized that there was one client which was a bit, two clients, for which freelancers had a weird way of working. Um, I'll skip the details, but basically we realized that many freelancers were working for Deliveroo and Take It Easy, which is another delivery, food delivery platform in Belgium, and that their way of working was not compatible with us. So our members were saying, could we use you please to declare we don't want to become self-employed? So we had an option either to say we don't want to work with these people or we try and negotiate something. And that's what we did. So we went to, the, to the, these platforms and we said, if you want to work with us, with our members rather, uh, you're going to have to comply with a few rules. So basically we made a, a commercial agreement that actually acts like a collective bargaining because we were able to negotiate that the workers were paid by the hour and not by the delivery, that they had minimum three, three hour shifts, that they were reimbursed for the use of their tools. So it's possible to regulate this. But here we had a, an economic advantage that they needed to be able to address the members that pass through SMART. And, but the regulator could also do something about that and I think there's a lot to do. When we arrived to these um, and these digital workers, we were really intrigued by all this new world of labor. And we realized that there's also a lot of very interesting models out there, such as the platform cooperativism, for example, where you don't just have an employer and employee. We also have to think outside that box. It, it is applicable to a lot of people. But there's a lot of situations where we have to think outside that box. A platform co-op, it's the, it's the riders and the users that are owner of the platform of the tool and they decide how value is created, capped and distributed. And there's also a question of governance. So I think there's a lot of things we can meditate upon and that are very interesting for the future of work. Very, and very digital. interesting ideas. And the key, the key word you know, Ralitza, is let's meditate on it. Because uh, unfortunately we have to thank our panelists and move on. But I would say uh, like this, I think for, for now we have more questions than answers and more challenges than solutions. Uh, and uh, you gave us all a lot of uh, uh, things to you know, contemplate and work on. So thank you very much again for your presence. Thank you very much. And also, Ralitza, I want to thank our audience for uh, being so involved in, uh, in this debate because we have the, the, their input on Slido. And I'm not talking about uh, the answer to our poll, which is wonderful and interesting. And the winner is uh, address that Europe sh should address negative effects on digitalization, on worker well-being, including mental health and stress. This but it's is a very interesting result. Yeah, because it, it, it is definitely a stress uh, issue to, to talk about and a concern for, uh, for the future. Because we don't know, nobody knows, even the experts don't know exactly how digitization will affect the workforce, but we have to be prepared for a lot of flexibility. That's the conclusion I'm drawing from talking to all right. these experts that I, we don't know enough 
and that's why we have to be flexible and work with things and work them out as they appear. I have to further encourage our audience to keep, uh, to stay logged on on Slido and keep asking questions. If you don't hear your questions picked up during our live debate on stage, do not worry. Your ideas and your questions will be heard by DG Connect. DG Connect is listening in the good way, and uh, your inclusive, including your questions will shape the future EU policies. So it's really important for you to participate. And I think now it's time for the social dialogue. What do you say, Ralitza? That's right. We, we heard a lot, Mihai, um, about the new forms of work, digitalization, cooperative platforms, digital skills, home and family employment. These are all important elements for the digital future of work. Well, uh, we must not forget about the core values of Europe. One of the bases of our European social model is the social dialogue through which the representatives of sides of industry, employers and employees negotiate and reach agreement to work together on policies and activities concerning labor relations. And so we're very glad to welcome on the stage the representatives of two key organizations representing the social partners. So for a lively dialogue in the next 10 minutes, we invite on stage Mr. Nils Trampe, chair of the working group on industrial relations of Business Europe, the European social partner representing businesses and employers. And Mr. Per Hilmersen, the deputy general secretary of the European Trade Union Federation, representing European workers across countries and industries. So well, let the new panel begin. And uh, we have one question that we would like both of you to answer. First to you, Mr. Trampe, give us your thoughts on what you just heard from the panelists and how you think that these ideas that came up today could drive the work of the European social partners for the future. Thank you very much. And first of all, thank you for the invitation and for the fantastic setting and for making us look better on the screen than in reality. <laughs> so it, it was easy. Okay. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> well, uh, the first point I want to uh, mention listening to um, the discussions we've just heard is that Europe is very different. You have half of Europe where you have full employment. Actually, the main problem for companies is lack of labor. And you have another half of Europe where you have unemployment and especially youth unemployment. And therefore, of course, people working for platforms might be the only way that they can get a, a job. But in other half of Europe, it's a decision by people that they want to work, for example, for a platform. So we should be very careful not to make generalization. Uh, and my first point is that um, for those countries who have bad functioning education systems, bad functioning labor market, I think that is where they should start. And they could look at those half of Europe uh, who have well-functioning education systems and well-functioning labor markets. And where you don't have these kind of discussions on people being misused and, and all of that. So that's my, my first point. But that does not mean that even in countries where you have well-functioning systems, you have constantly to adapt them to digital developments. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I think I will, that is my uh, main point. And we as social partners, uh, of course, we also want to contribute, and we have done that already in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, in 2002, we made a framework agreement between us uh, on and, what was called telework at that time. And we will talk about this as our second question, but first Perfect. we want to really address you know, what you heard from the panelists. And it's yeah. interesting that you see a disparity that you think should be addressed. Mr. Hilmerson, what about you? What, did, what is your takeaway from the panel and how can the two of you work together on those issues? Thanks. Um, well, first and foremost, it's been very interesting discussions. Um, I learned a lot, but I recognize a lot also. Um, the analysis made here today is the same made by the European Trade Union movement. And this is a huge uh, challenge for us, of course, 
digitalization can play a very positive role for workers, um, for workers' autonomy, work-life balance, uh, and releasing workers from dangers or, or um, hard work, uh, routine tasks, but also, of course, negative role uh, in terms of uh, precarious work, more uh, stress at work, uh, polarization of jobs. So we, we must look at both opportunities and the risk, and I think this uh, event is doing that, and the report by the high-level expert group is also very, very good. Um, I think a key ingredient is collective bargaining. Uh, collective agreements and making sure that workers are informed and consulted and are represented at, at board level, for instance. Collective bargaining is fundamental for workers in, in order for them to adapt to digital transformation. We, together with the employers, we can agree on qualifications, on upskilling, outsourcing a task, working time, wages, of course, health and safety. But we also need public policies. Um, when workers um, face unemployment because of digital transformation, they need to be ensured that there are policies in place for for uh, uh, counselling, training, uh, other active, active labour market policies. Because it, we need to understand that the, the security in the labour market doesn't lie in the job that you have, but in the job that you can get. So this is the, the main the main points. Well, excellent. Uh, very specific uh, points uh, have already been made. Uh, also, uh, some previous uh, framework uh, agreed uh, has, uh, has been mentioned. But I don't know if this is public knowledge already, but you recently started a new a negotiation for a framework agreement on digitalization. And here we are on this uh, uh, stage talking about that. Uh, can you please give us a hint, even if the discussions are at the beginning, where uh, do you think you'll agree very fast and disagree also? And wh what are the, the bumps down the road? I'll, I'll start. Uh, and we have the start of the negotiations on the 25th of June. And uh, on the employer side, we have our mandate and I'm sure you have your mandate for the negotiations, and it's a negotiation that takes on for nine months, at least. So it's a proper negotiation. So, and I, so I don't think, maybe we could do it within 10 minutes, uh, us two, but <laughs> I'm not sure the negotiation is going to be as easy as that. Uh, so let me just give you some indications. First of all, it will be focused on where it is our responsibility. So that means the workplace, uh, first and foremost. So what are shared experiences at company level uh, for dealing with digitalization uh, in the working situation and how can that help uh, to inspire others uh, to do similar things um, and also if i may just come back to what we heard before uh, not very many spoke about the company level and I think that is, in fact, I mean, if you look at what company put into of resources into education and training, it's at least as big as what uh, the legislator is providing of education and training. And the advantage of companies doing things is also that it's directly directed towards the consumer. I think someone mentioned that we should not do digitalization just for the sake of digitalization. We should always remember that we do it because there's a customer either a company or us as customers. So that is very important also in view of, of young people. So I think we'll focus very much on, on the company level. In the past, if I may just mention, we made a big agreement a few years ago about young people, which is a special problem in Europe. And one of the things that we now both support is dual training of young people. Why? So meaning that you're both in school, but you're also in the company level learning something. Again, the philosophy is that you have to see digital skills as doing something in a workplace. You have to that is in demand that, that, that's a that you can get thing. a job in once you graduate. Sorry? That you can get a job in once you graduate. You get a job that you see yeah. that it's not just gaming on, on, on uh, your yeah. uh, computer, which a lot of young people love, but you can actually provide something which gives you an earning and All right. Which, so you provide something to society. That's a positive attitude that you're entering these negotiations. Let's yeah. hear from the other side. Uh, yeah, this, this will be 
exciting, and we we go into these negotiations with with an open mind, of course, and constructive approach. We already in February actually had a, a fruitful fact-finding seminar, as we called it, to prepare these uh, negotiations, where we explored different uh, national experiences related to skills requirements, uh, work organization, um, and working conditions. And, and these are the issues we, we would like to address, actually, in these negotiations from the uh, workers' side, uh, working conditions, work organization, including the right to disconnect and, uh, and skills. So let's see how it goes. Well, good luck with that. We, we can all benefit from this fr framework. Thank you very much to both of you. And as, a, as an advice from us, if you want, take as long as you need to make this framework really good for the future. But not too long, but because the future is now. <laughs> yeah. Well, on this stage, we'll have to thank you again for your presence and you. uh, keep going with the event. Thank you very much, sir. Radica. Yeah. We worked a lot, didn't yeah, we? Yeah, we worked a lot. <laughs> and I hope people enjoyed this uh, first part. But after work, something has to come, right? That's it, right. And this is not a negotiation. Work-life balance, it... right? Work-coffee balance. <laughs> yes. So uh, we follow now with a break with a coffee flavor. 15 minutes, coffee break. See you back here. Thank you. And when you come back, we'll talk about how digital technology can help us on a very, very local level in the places where we live. Digital for Communities is coming up next. You don't want to miss that. Enjoy your coffee.
So far, we have talked about digital transformation and its impact on jobs, on leadership, and on the planet. Challenging? Yes, of course, but it also represents enormous economic opportunities and sustainable growth. That's why we are now opening a new session of Digital Assembly 2019, Digital for Communities. Digital transformation affects our daily lives in ways we can see and feel as our communities change before our eyes. And before we dive into our discussion on this topic, let us first watch a video which will set the scene for our discussion. Today's digital revolution is not just about technology. It's about transforming our everyday lives. Across 80,000 local authorities in Europe, we share the same goals. Improve our quality of life. Tackle environmental and climate change challenges. Support competitiveness and create job opportunities. Promote effective, open local government. Throughout Europe, many communities already benefit from the digital single market. Citizens are actively involved in decision-making, co-creating local legislation through an online platform. Remote medical care allows constant patient monitoring and runs checkups outside medical facilities. Regional small and medium-sized enterprises are accessing finance for innovative projects. And in a European city, 20,000 citizens are contributing to plans to reduce pollution by measuring air quality near their homes. To measure and manage digital benefits across the EU, we are introducing the new Local Digital Economic Society Index, helping to enhance local economies, services, and democracy. The digital revolution starts with citizens, with local people empowered to design local solutions. Is your community equipped for the transformation? Already we see automated public transportation being tested. We have smart recycling in several cities, sensors measuring pollution levels, smart lightning systems, the list of smart applications goes on and on. They have the potential to improve our quality of our lives. And we, it will certainly will. But this digital assembly is discussing future policies. Our national or European policies are not always, you know, experienced by the citizens, not knowingly anyway. But the implementation by the local community is. And on the local level, we often hear about smart solutions for local economies, services and democracy. But some are smart in transport, others in energy or waste. And to be realistic, no one is smart all over. Okay, and let's uh, say someone uh, actually gets it right in one area and finds the best solution. How can we scale up and share to make us all better? And how can we monitor the progress on a more local level, similar to what the Digital Economy and Society Index, DAISY, does on national level? So, let's invite on the stage Mr. Marco Marcula, the first Vice President of the European Committee of the Regions, who will give us a short introductory speech on the importance of regions and the topics we will be discussing. Welcome, sir. Welcome. Um, thank you, and uh, great to be here. It's, it's really great that we have this special session, and especially focusing on communities, because that's where the action is, that's where the people make the changes to happen. And let me just highlight a few of the key, key points coming actually from uh, uh, different, uh, 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 different uh, sessions here. And uh, maybe starting with especially what you said about scaling, sharing, and monitoring. But uh, my good friend, uh, Mr. Alin Adrian uh, Nika, will later on talk a bit more about that because that's the 
special uh, communication proposals that the Committee of the Regions, uh, representing all 350 members, mayors, regional presidents, councils from around Europe. So we have prepared working in very good close collaboration with, especially with DG Connect, but other directorates as well. But I think that it's just fair here to start, as in the, the short video, it's highlighted the life, life of uh, people and where and what is needed for that. If, if I can be very brief on that, so, so it's about SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. And now we have all the basis for the roadmaps, uh, several roadmaps for uh, implementation based on the UN uh, SDGs or 17 SDGs. And nice that especially this assembly has already focused quite much on those because I could say that uh, digital is the fuel for making those things to happen in a much faster way that uh, we think has and is possible. That's why I want to stress that even here in Bucharest uh, two days ago, our uh, Committee of the Region, our special uh, commission on environmental energy and and uh, climate issues worked on and approved uh, the opinion uh, which will be later on uh, uh, having uh, voted at our plenary. And that opinion is focusing especially on SDGs, but these environmental and climate issues. And there as well, we know that uh, uh, those targets could never be implemented unless we take digital as the fuel. And this is what I want to stress heavily uh, today and in the near future. We should focus much more on the question how, how to implement that. And thanks to our moderators, they already stress that it's the local level uh, as well. Many parallel activities happen. Yesterday I was contributing to the uh, strategic energy technology uh, 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 conference. Uh, and there, the key was this national uh, energy and climate plans. But what I stressed in my conclusions was that let's take it more seriously than we need to have local uh, city-driven uh, plans on those issues. And this is what I want to address here as well. So we need to use the latest knowledge uh, uh, and uh, research results focusing on all of those uh, SDGs. We need to take the effective digitalization in an overarching and crucial success factor. And we need more local collaboration and European partnerships based on the smart specialization strategies that every region in Europe already has. And that this makes that we need forerunner cities, forerunner regions. I'm happy as well to tell that uh, we, my city, Espo, the western part of Melsing, metropolitan area, we have challenged ourselves to be one of those forerunner cities that implement all those 17 SDGs already by 2025, not waiting the target year 2030, which UN has set. Uh, and, and then on that process, we want to help support the others, do a lot of more mentoring. And that's why I, I've captured a lot of ideas from this conference as well. But let me just briefly say what came to me out of the session yesterday on this uh, uh, co community. So, and that first that the ecosystem is uh, the new warehouse. Uh, and supply chains are part of that, so we are moving faster than ever, but we are building our region's kind of ecosystem over several ecosystems, and that's why digitalization is something that integrates the different activities together. Network effect is crucial in scaling. Data is the new currency, as we discussed yesterday, but someone needs to take the role of orchestrator, and on that, so we have cities, but uh, especially so that cities nominate a few of the key people to take that role, working together with universities, research centers, schools and kindergartens as well, because that's where the future is, is really invented. And that's why DG4, uh, the education and learning is so crucial, covering all the rest as well as digitalization. 
with these words, so let's enjoy and have a really uh, encouraging debate uh, today. Uh, so there's much to do, and every one of us who are here should take a few action points along when you go home, talk that to your neighbors, to your business partners, and uh, create this joint European movement so that in Europe we can showcase clearly that we take not only our responsibility in our cities, but throughout uh, the global collaboration as well. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Makula. Shall I sit down here? No, you can take your uh, seat back in, okay. in the audience uh, while we introduce our panelists to de develop further the, the lines that uh, you challenged us to, to tackle in our next uh, panel. So I guess the, the question is, Ralica and uh, everyone uh, presented here, is your local community equipped for the digital transformation? That is the topic we're going to be discussing with our distinguished panel, so why not invite them right now to the stage? Let's do that. Mr. Matthias de Klerk, Mayor of Ghent. Mr. Well, Alina Adrian Nika, COR, Commission Vice President, also Mayor of Dudeshti Noi, Timish County. Mr. Decebal Fagadu, Mayor of Consta Constanza. That's right. Mrs. Hortense Lutz, Vice Chair of European Regions Research and Innovation Network. Mr. Case van de Klau, Chairman of the Alliance of the Internet of Things and Innovation. Ms. Erzebet Fitori, Director of the Fiber to the Home Council Europe on the Infrastructure Deployment. And Mr. Martin Brunskor, founding member of the Open and Agile Smart Cities Initiative. Welcome to all of you. And we would like to pose the same question to the mayors, beginning with the mayor of Ghent, Mr. De Klerk. We'd like to ask each one of you, is there a digital innovation application or service that you have implemented in your city that you're particularly proud of and you can't wait to share it? Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's a, it's a big honor to be here as a city of Ghent. We are in the heart of Flanders, of Belgium, of Europe, and uh, I have a lot of good examples to say, but um, maybe first the philosophy as a whole. Our slogan is Ghent is that we are running in several years a very successful smart city program and digitalization is a very important component uh, of that. But we in Ghent, our slogan is smart cities needs smart citizens. So technology, dig digitalization is not a purpose on its own. It's an enabler to tackle uh, things we have to challenge eh? because there are a lot of challenges in, in a lot of cities. And for example, one amazing example, I think, is a great cooperation between the, Ghent, the city of Ghent, the University of Ghent, because we have 70,000 students, so a vibrant city, and IMEC is the research and development center, who work together to tackle a big challenge, it's to say loneliness. Loneliness, socially isolated people, especially senior citizens, and they made a very good exercise to increase contacts with volunteer buddies to tackle loneliness because we, have, we, have, we are a great city, but it's a big challenge to tackle that because after beautiful walls, there are a lot of people who are very lonesome. And then technology is an enabler to bring together isolated people and volunteer buddies to have contacts, to go outside, yeah, to live, to, to become more free. So I think that's a very, very attractive solution and we are very proud on and more of that, we won the Smart in the City Prize of the Fle Flemish government. So it was a big honor for us. Wow, Thanks. excellent first uh, answer. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Vittori, was that a selfie? Did you take a selfie? Be you, you know, we are a digital uh, conference, so maybe you can uh, have a selfie with wonderful, this wonderful, wonderful setup. I want to ask uh, Mr. Alinika, the same question actually, but maybe from the double perspective. You have a European uh, level uh, function and also you are a mayor of a smaller, let's say, municipality. So are you adept to digital technology already? Well, I'm also an IT uh, engineer, so uh, um, 
it's a defect, professional defect for me to speak about the IT sector and the digital digitalization. But uh, to give just an example from a rural municipality in Romania of how the ICT can uh, um, influence the life of the citizens, I will give you a, actually a project, of an idea that we are going to implement in, in the next year. Uh, it's about digitalization, the water supply system, and to uh, have a, a command and control panel um, at the mayor house, and from that panel to read all the, the, um, the uh, I don't know how it is in, in, in English. The, Tell uh, me in Romanian, I'll try to help you. The <laughs> aquameter from the citizens. Okay, so water meters? Yeah, water okay, meters, to me yes. Okay, to and measure the, the water consumption. Yes, That's fine. and also to if, uh, make the system more effective uh, using uh, real-time uh, consum consumers um, um, coverage and all the other uh, kind of uh, um, information that we need in order to optimize the system. So everything uh, can be digitalized. Digitalization is part of our daily lives and local and regional authorities must adjust to the new digital realities. Are you leading by example? Because Dudeshi know it's a small s town or city, I don't know, how many people uh, are there? We have uh, 3,700. Uh, you see, <laughs> a, it's a village actually, yes, right? It is. So, uh, is this being a small community, is it an advantage or a disadvantage first in accessing funds to smarten up your uh, community and then implementing these projects? Is it easier or more no, difficult? No, no, it's, it's not a dis disadvantage. Actually, it's, it's, it's an advantage um, that we can use to scale up the experiences um, because every program uh, can be tested at a smaller scale and then scaled up to, to, uh, um, to major cities or uh, yeah, regions, actually. And I, I, I would like to give you another example because we are going to speak about the Wi-Fi for EU in, in a few minutes at the ceremony. Well, I, I went ahead of that European initiative and actually implemented um, public hotspots in major parts of the municipality and they are actually working great. It's, I, I actually created, we created through these hotspots points of gathering for the citizens um, that socialize not only virtually but also physically because that's an, another uh, major problem that we have today. We don't physically interact, we uh, um, interact more virtually, and that's a shortcoming of the digitalization era. That's true, we, we text even though <laughs> we're next to each yeah. other. Yeah, and, and maybe we need to explain that we'll have a ceremony, uh, Wi-Fi for EU, which uh, basically will have uh, several representatives of municipalities who are receiving vouchers to uh, develop free Wi-Fi for their communities. And it's a great idea, but we'll talk a little bit later about it and uh, uh, you'll get to see that idea. But I want to go to Ms. Lutz right now. And uh, you can give us the regional perspective. Uh, uh, Mr. Nico was saying how he has a tiny community, but he's already scaling and sharing his ideas. So how can ideas that uh, best practices be spread around on a regional level? Thank you very much. Um, actually, it's part of our mission as a network. So the network I represent is ERIN, so it's a regional uh, innovation research network. So we gather a region working on research and innovation. So we are a Brussels-based network, uh, but all our regional offices are bringing back with regional stakeholders, clusters, university, academics, and uh, we are really like trying to uh, promote this collaborative approach so we want to change the way local and regional uh, stakeholders are working together on this quadruple helix and really try to promote this ecosystem uh, thinking that Mr. Marcula mentioned um, as well. So we think that regional uh, innovation ecosystem uh, can contribute to a better impact of uh, innovation and research policies, uh, including an, an digital uh, transformation. And, and just to give you um, an, an example of what we can do, so our, our idea is to better connect all regional actors, so yes, cities, 
universities, research center working together, and then to connect all this regional ecosystem together in Europe. And a good tool uh, we are focusing in Erin is the Digital Innovation Hub. So I'm, I'm sure you know about Digital Innovation Hub. It's a tool promoted by DigiConnect. Uh, the idea again is to identify at regional level all kind of stakeholders that can contribute to the digitization of enterprises and, and, um, and to connect them at regional level. And we think it's a very good um, a way to, um, to be sure to, um, to cover the needs of the, of the users users are uh, enterprises, but also citizen administration. Um, so it's a good way to, um, to connect all these stakeholders together. And uh, if I can give an example, in my own region, auvergne rhone alpes we have launched uh, such a digital innovation uh, hub. It's called Mina Smart auvergne rhone alpes And uh, as I mentioned, we have in this uh, hub, we have university, research center, clusters, and all working on digitalization. Uh, but to make it more concrete, uh, we have tried to identify market application. And for this, we have been bathing uh, this market approach on our regional innovation strategy for smart specialization. Because you know, at the region, we are uh, managing authority of uh, regional structural funds. We have to define a strategy of smart specialization and digitization was part of this strategy, but also other sectors like health, transport, energy. Um, so yeah, I think it's a good example of how we can uh, connect um, regional ecosystem, digital strategy, uh, and smart specialization, specialization strategy. And of course, next step is how we better promote collaboration between all these ecosystem in, uh, in Europe. Thank you. All right. So I would like now to address, uh, pose a, a question to Mr. Van der Klo. Uh, well, yeah. It's about, uh, you know, I was trying to make a, a linkage between other panels. I don't know if you followed the, the, the yesterday uh, sessions. It's about data. We collect data, but we don't know uh, who uh, owns this data and uh, how can we share this data to the public benefit. So I would uh, last to address the questions. Hi how can we access it and, you know, exploit this data in a, a moral and useful manner? That's a difficult question uh, and extremely important for the development of uh, smart society. I think first we have to recognize uh, the origin of data. So for me, the ownership of data is with the origin. So that can be an individual, can be a citizen, can also be a company, it can be public data. Uh, and as a matter of fact, in the consumer market, this whole data sharing is already established without people really understanding in what they bought into. I think most people share their personal data by just the click on the mobile phone um, and actually they trade their data in return of a game or a nice app. Uh, so it's, it, in that sense, it's already developing and people apparently put trust into those applications, otherwise they wouldn't do it. That doesn't mean that all these applications are trustworthy. Trustworthiness is not the same as trust. Trust is about perception. So if you want to share data for a city or a society, it's extremely important to start building trust. And trust can only come with transparency. So early involvement of citizens, of end users in what's the flow of the data? What are we going to do with it? And that's not a matter of explaining once, it's a matter of explaining continuously and continuously involving people. I think that's a major challenge because the reputation that is often put on large companies is that they are not trustworthy. Um, and also the European, I'm sure that the European Commission has all the interest in doing the best for its citizens. And yet you see a lot of distrust in, in, in how data should be managed. But it's extremely important for the development of use cases like you mentioned in, in uh, uh, let's say fighting uh, loneliness, uh, in improving healthcare, etc. So for me, it's, it starts with building trust and transparency, and there are plenty of technologies that could support that, like distributed ledger technologies, which can secure that the ownership is always retained and can even be recalled if you don't like the application. 
Thank you. I'd like to uh, shift our conversation now a little bit to infrastructure and, and move on uh, with a question to uh, Ms. Vittori, to you. What kind of infrastructure do we need for connected communities from your point of view? Um, uh, thank you very much for, for the question. Um, in, um, indeed, I do believe that the question of infrastructure is a very core issue because I think all of the points that were raised before, so really kind of smart cities, uh, kind of smartening up the kind of economic activities or indeed e-health applications we have seen in the video are actually fundamentally depend, uh, dependent on very high, very high capacity networks on infrastructure. Um, and I think that it is very important for especially smaller communities that the ambition is high and that we do not accept a gigabit divide, but we try to actually prevent it from the outset um, so that um, the investments are happening in really future-proofed full fiber or fiber-based 5G, very high capacity networks. Um, one might be tempted because the, the cost can be high for these networks to actually accept more incremental upgrades. But I think that they will co these will cost more in the long term. So I think that for smaller communities, actually the future proofing of the networks is, is almost more important than the price I get. Sorry. I just want to quickly ask Mr. Nika a follow-up question on that for your small community. Um, what are your funding needs to be able to uh, make this infrastructure accessible uh, for, for all if you were to, to ask the European Union for any funding? What, what is your thinking about infrastructure for small communities? Well, when we, when we speak about infrastructure, uh, there's an instant connection to the spreading of the broadband broadband internet and uh, to meet our target of having 100 megabytes uh, in each household I think that's a very very ambitious objective especially because mainly in rural and scarcely populated areas or in isolated uh, regions or even parts of major cities but with uh, uh, poor population it's very difficult to have the operators, the companies, the telecom companies, um, to have them to invest in the infrastructure. That's why the European Union should intervene with grants, with financial support, uh, especially in these areas, so that the proliferation of broadband and the accessibility um, of broadband to the citizens to be uh, an effective fact. So I think that's the idea that we are going to promote from the Committee of the Regions in, uh, in what concerns the spreading of the broadband, to have a solid European financial support in these particular areas where market, free market fails to, to provide us with these kind of services. You know, there is a saying, small kids, small problems, big kids, big problems. So uh, before uh, asking you to change the hat from the mayor to the representative of the European Committee of the Regions and uh, give us some slides, I would ask Mr. Brunsko to uh, advise, you know, the local authorities, small or big, on what should they be aware when they are entering the smart world that actually we, we have already entered, right? Indeed, yes. Uh, thanks for asking me for advice. I, I will share some reflections uh, and then you can see how, how that matches your situation. So just to be specific, my organization, what I represent is a network of networks. So we, think, we talk here about sharing and scaling and this is what the network is all about. One point, you cannot come alone. All right. So in the Open Agile Smart Cities Network, one city cannot join. You have to come as a network. So first thing is find out who you want to work with and join a global community of learning what to do. So that's the first thing. Work together with relevant peers. The second thing is if we need to reach global scale, and let's be honest, the digital realm is global. 
you need to connect this local collaboration with something that matches that massive scale. So find ways, also technically, and maybe we can come back to that, to ensure that when you have good solutions for loneliness, for wastewater management, for the Wi-Fi for you, it's a fantastic example of reaching really broadly. Ensure that it can actually be reused in many systems across sectors. It's very difficult, but if you remember those two things that are quite simple, in fact, they're not very complex ingredients, they're, they're, they're fundamental components you can slowly develop from where you are. So that would be my reflection to that very complicated uh, question. No, the question is simple. The, ex the answer is complicated, and uh, that's why we gather here to you know, envision some solutions, uh, some working solutions. So maybe we should ask Mr. Nika now to give us uh, the few slides that he prepared uh, uh, from the European Committee of Regions. All right. Yes, well, thank you very much. Um, ah, so all, you got the clicker. Yeah, I was looking for it yeah, to give I it to it, you. So it. you already got it. Excellent. Great. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, uh, the Committee of the Region, whenever I go to a conference, I always say a few words about the Committee of the Regions because not many uh, citizens of the European Union know about this very important institution of uh, the EU. So the Committee of the Regions is one of the uh, seven, I think, European institutions that actually gathers representatives from the local and regional level at the heart of the European Union in Brussels. Uh, I personally am the first Vice President of the Commission for Social Policy, Education, Employment, Research and Culture in the Committee of the Regions. We are around 90 members of the committee here and we actually tackle the subject of uh, of research and innovation, digital agenda, EU information society, and trans-European um, telecom networks. So mainly, it covers the digitalization issue at the local and regional level. Our main message that we want to, to transmit all over the Europe is that our regions, our cities, our towns and villages can contribute to, first, a more um, digital revolution uh, at, the, at the EU level because we think that uh, digital revolution starts from the local level. We cannot start top down, but I think bottom up is, is uh, better from the reasons that I told you when I answered to the question if we can scale up our experiences at the local level to major cities to bigger areas. I think, yes, we can test our uh, um, ideas in a small community and then see if it works. It's also financial effective. And if we make mistakes, at least it costs less than if we make mistakes at a uh, higher level or on a larger scale. I think and we think that the EU needs to develop new ways, new ways to deploy smart digital solutions and um, using the local and regional level which is closest to the citizens, I think we can also have a better impact um, at the citizens' level. And lastly, I think we can help Europe to increase its global competitiveness and close the European digital divide. Um, digital literacy is also an issue that we have to tackle. In order to have a real revolution, we have to have digital citizens. Some of our colleagues already mentioned that. And of course, we are very ambitious in, in that direction. Lifelong learning can help us improve the digital um, literacy in uh, our local communities. And uh, I think that I will skip this, uh, this uh, slide. I think that being proactive it's the best way that we, local and regional uh, level, can influence the EU decisions. So we came up with, uh, with a document, with a proposal for a strategic agenda of the next uh, European Commission, and we called it Digital Europe for All. In this strategic document, we put three main ideas that we think uh, would uh, change the face of Europe at local and regional level in terms of digitalization. 
and because we spoke about networks, not only individuals, we proposed to have three clusters, local economy cluster, um, democracy, local democracy cluster, and service cluster. The first one, the local economy cluster, meets the challenges of con connectivity, interoperability of our uh, uh, sy different systems, and of course we have to st standardize them. Um, a strong skills base, a human-driven fair data economy, and also the recycling, reusing of uh, data that we already have, and the close interaction between businesses, research institutions, um, and civil society, the helix that you spoke about. And we very proudly promoted um, the, tri the triple, the quadruple, actually, healings at the European level. And our main proposals in this, in this respect is to boost the broadband com um, connectivity. I already spoke about that. Uh, it, it not only boosts local economy, um, having a broadband connectivity in the most remote areas, but it also stirs the uh, young entrepreneurs to uh, have initiative, and that's what we think is very important in order to decrease the level of unemployment in the young generation. It doesn't matter if you're on top of a mountain or in the middle of the Danube's Delta, if you have a laptop and a broadband, you can very well manage your business from, from a, a distance. Um, and that is also in relation with uh, the new technology, with um, uh, the 5G uh, coverage that we are going to implement in, in the EU. And you, we should also notice that we are actually lagging behind because the United States and Japan already auctioned the frequencies, the 5G frequencies, that we are only starting now to do so in some uh, uh, member states. So we are in a competition with the rest of the world, with the Southeast, Southeast Asia, and we have to be leaders in, in the new digital economy. Of course, the local service cluster um, tackles many challenges that we are facing at the local and regional level. Um, many services that the local municipalities provide to the citizens have to be digitalized. Uh, digitalized. I think that a citizen, the, the digital citizen, uh, must have the opportunity of uh, having a, a, cities, a, a service with one click or one touch. He doesn't have to go to the mayor house or to other public services to, to um, have the services that they need. So we have to reshape our thinking, reshape our strategies, and actually make a digital strategy at every local and regional level uh, so that we can uh, adjust to the new uh, realities. And the last one, because of course we can speak a lot about, uh, about these uh, clusters, is the local democracy cluster with um, a specific um, pinpoint on the citizens' involvement in the local and regional decision-making process. We all saw around Europe the reluctance of the citizens to the mainstream parties, the reluctance of the citizens to the European level. Well, I think we can come up with some pro concrete proposals in order to involve the citizens in, in the decision-making process and make them part of the decision. I think that's how we can fight with the populists, with the Euroscepticists, and all of those who want this very important project that's called the European Union to fall apart. So developing an app for permanent dialogue with the citizens at the local level can also um, shortcut the distance between Brussels and the, far, uh, the, 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 the last local municipality in the, uh, in the EU. Of course, it's an ambitious proposal, but if all the municipalities um, agree on that decision, I think it would be very helpful for the European Commission to have direct information from the local level, to have direct uh, surveys 
uh, uh, at the local level and have the input that it needs in order to shape up the uh, European policies. Okay, I spoke, I think, too much, uh, and uh, I did so not because I wanted to, because I, because I was inspired by uh, all the panelists and all the debates we had uh, these two days. I have a suspicion and I that think you enjoyed that's it. not my fault, <laughs> and it's all your fault. Yeah. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you, sir. Well, I want to uh, direct one follow-up question from what you had to say to uh, Mr. Bruns Brunskoy as a founding member of the Open and Agile Smart Cities Initiative. Uh, some of the speakers have been bringing up uh, the fact that there are a lot of different standards and rules and, and that that's a barrier to sharing and scaling uh, good ideas and innovation. From your experience, what are the solutions for that? To keep things simple. <laughs> the problem is that we yeah. have too many standards exactly yet that you, as you say we don't need more initiatives we need convergence so what we preach is let's come together the different networks our network is is super focused on only creating what we call minimal interoperability mechanisms we let the policies uh, handled by committee regions your cities uh, un fine so I think really the convergence and this call for collaboration from both sides of the market, right? So the industry has not been able to develop standardized way of delivering services that fit the complexity of communities. That's the issue. And the communities have not been able to formulate, let's say in business and technical terms, what they need. So we need to close this gap. And this is what the new upcoming programs like the Digital Europe program are so essential for. But we need to find this simple way of linking. We cannot make it too complex, then it will never fit the almost uh, 100,000 local uh, communities in Europe. So we have to keep things simple. And Mr. de Klerk, what are the challenges that, that you see in uh, and getting the, the rules and the standards and the incentives uh, that could help smart cities like yours. Can I, uh, sorry, can I step in, Ralitza, and help you out? Okay, oh, of course, well, for Mr. Gent, because uh, for the mayor of Ghent, because I have here, I, I see here you are uh, part of the smart cities open data reuse. So my specific question, in addition of uh, those of Ralitza's, is. Do you collect data from your citizens in Ghent? Do they know? And what are you doing with that? Yeah, we are we are one of the, the first cities in Belgium who came with a policy of open data. So we collect them and we put them on the internet so it's accessible for all citizens. And as we are the biggest education city in Belgium, we are a vibrant city, there are a lot of brains, a lot of talent, and then we have a lot of startups, scale-ups, so I think it's very not only uh, interesting to share them but it's necessary to share them because uh, there are new things on this on the market who appears by great minds that we have in our in our city and i think a big challenge eh, as you ask is that that we have to come to yeah um, all citizens have the same digital rights because that's also a challenge on his own we are a young city but we have also a lot of other senior citizens and also they have to have digital rights, digital skills, learning, and we also do that as a city to bring them together and to, to, to give them the chance to learn that also, to go on internet, to have open data, to, to do things with it. So that I think it's very important, but we have infrastructure, we have collaboration, but very important is also good education. I think every, everything st starts with good education um, that, that children are, uh, have good education, that they can think for his own, that they can uh, f live in a free city, but also in a city where the quality of life is good, because all these elements bring together great minds. And, and that's important to have. We, are, we totally agree with the proposition of, uh, of uh, the Committee of the Regions. And we are, we as a city of Ghent, we are active in Euro cities, as Martin mentioned, there are 140 uh, cities. And we want to put on European agenda, we want that the new European Commission has a commissioner for urban agenda. Because when we want to tackle also populists and Euroceptists, it all starts in the cities. 
with the citizens and when there is a better match between the cities and Europe, and I'm a believer, I'm positive, eh? also a digital optimist, eh? I'm a believer, I think we can, we can do that. So it's very important that Europe also recognize the importance of the cities, the citizens, and, and, and get some good infrastructure. And with a good quality of life, I'm very optimist. For Mr. Van der Klaar, I want to continue um, with uh, another uh, aspect that we wanted to discuss in this session, and that is about measuring what we're doing. Uh, how can you, from your perspective, how can the Internet of Things, how can you put sensors, collect data, in which communities can measure their success and compare it to others and inspire each other to share and advance? Yeah, there are many aspects. So, uh, technically, uh, I think interoperability is, is the, the second best thing. So, uh, a worldwide standard would be great, but that's never going to happen. Uh, and I think we should stop in inventing and pushing new standards. I think it's about choosing a standard. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you can't come to a standard, then work on the next level, which is interoperability. So, in our association, we have a working group that is specifically focusing enabling the chain, so making sure that sensors can connect and to, to feedback to the cities. Don't underestimate your power to, to set that standard yeah, and, and say this is the API that we want to use and I'm sure that industry will follow. Yeah. Um, and then of course on the next level it's about uh, the, yeah, the, the, the management of the data, uh, the uh, use cases uh, and establishing common standards. So I very much like your proposal of the peer-to-peer the -peer learning and the audit, and I would even suggest to combine the things by having peer audits, Do you want where to? cities are going to visit representatives from citizens to majors, are going to visit other cities to see how they do it and report back best practices. That creates a common understanding of something that on paper looks like a common process. Uh, and it takes a lot of effort to do that, but it worked very well in industry. So I think it could also be applied in this network. Right. But when I see so many uh, digital optimists, as you uh, present yourselves, in collecting and sharing the data, I have to act as the pessimist and ask you collectively, pick up the question, uh, uh, whoever wants to do that. Uh, how about the um, uh, wrong intentions? How about the competitions? How about the blockage that uh, a private company uh, would put you know, in sharing the data. So how can we deal with that? Because on the other hand, because uh, Europe has at, as, uh, at its core uh, the value of uh, civil uh, uh, rights so, so developed, we have one of the most advanced data protection regulations, GDPR, right? So how can we balance the two? Yeah. Please go on with yeah. your answer, and so if also someone else wants to pick it up. Large-scale pilots are not just to test technology, they're also to test applications uh, and uh, acceptance, uh, legal frameworks, uh, how these things should work. I think what is essential is that European industry is maybe a bit scared by the advancements in the US and China. Hey, we have to keep our data, otherwise we lose uh, the money. But the only value is by data sharing. Sitting on your data will not create any value. And what we see in the association... Depends on the volume. Depends on the volume. When you have data on 5 billion people, then you don't want to share. Correct, but if you don't use it, you're never going to monitor Absolutely. it. Absolutely, yep. And in practice, there's no single company that can make the most of value from its data, of course, for your own purposes, if you want to improve your equipment, if you want to improve your buses, that is closed data. But if you want to create new value, the only way is to collaborate in a chain. And what we have to learn is that you can only make money by first investing in sharing that data. And, and the best thing is to bring people together. I worked for a long time for Philips, and a great example is uh, the, the U lighting system where we had 200 external app developers that got access via a common API to a platform which was established by the company. And that created so much value for both, it could never have been done by a single large company. So there are great examples, and you just have to matchmake and bring together companies that are willing to experiment in a large-scale pilot in a protected environment, and then see how you can scale up. 
I want to open um, another point here. Ms. Lutz, if I can ask you about that. A lot of this data which private companies are collecting is our data. It's public data. So uh, the GDPR takes care of our privacy, but it really doesn't look at the economic aspect and value of this data. So um, how can we make sure uh, of the fair use of, of people's data? Oh, this is a um, quite a difficult question, but um, um, talking about data and, uh, and, and, and indicators, and um, I would want more to focus on, on, on the proposal of the Committee of the Region to have, uh, you know, regional and local indicators to measure uh, digitalization. And uh, I would just like to mention, we think it's a very good uh, idea because we, we lack. Uh, this kind of uh, indicators uh, at European level, so to, to have a better idea of uh, uh, what's going on at, in other regions and, and city, and so the idea of this index of uh, indicators, we, we think it's a very good, uh, very good idea. And actually, all um, I want also to mention that it, this um, digital Europe for all strategy uh, proposed by the Committee of the Region uh, as an airing network. Uh, we will think it's going in the right direction because it's really based on this territorial approach. Uh, so, yeah, we, again, we think that the region and city at the good level for implement this uh, digital strategy. So th thank you to the Committee of the Region for launching this initiative. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Brunsko, want to make that a That was the last question, but it doesn't have to be the last answer. So let's hear it now. <coughs> I, I think... Yes, there's a lot of money in data. We can obviously see that some of the most valuable companies in the world work with data. But perhaps we should not think so much about data as oil or gold or things to be monetized as much as air or it's like water. And investing in the infrastructures and the treatment of data with the same mindset so that we have a good digital environment for our citizens, for our businesses, you can make a lot of money around that, right? I mean, pumping water, it, it's pumps in the world are 10% of the energy, combined energy consumption of the world, pumps. So of course there will be money and also adverse effects in pumping around data. But I think we have to think a little bit differently than just something to be monetized or, you know, kept close. It's, it's a little bit, little bit like a little child that wants to keep sunshine in a box. It's not going to be sunshine anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think there has to be a shift. And then, of course, we have to bring the demand side together. So the, the communities, the authorities, to speak with confidence towards the market, just as we heard from, from the Alliance for IoT Innovation, the market will follow. But we have to organize that voice and come with demands for a good digital environment. So maybe a, a shift in how we see what data is. And I think that's a great note to end on. Absolutely. We're not that's, gonna that's, keep the sunlight in a box, shift our thinking and... That for sure put a smile on our faces and maybe made some more of us digital optimists. Uh, I would like to thank our panelists. I think that we can conclude this panel on that note. And Absolutely. thank you all again very, very much. Thank you very much. We posed you some, uh, some difficult questions at times. And, uh, and please take your seat back in the audience. You gave us a lot of food for thought. And we thank you very much. Best of luck in your efforts. Now, Mihai, before we close the session, we have a special celebration that will take place here on this stage. We're talking about a simple yet very powerful initiative for connecting communities called Wi-Fi for EU. And I think this is the perfect example 
to an initiative from the EU that hits the core of local and regional policies at the same time, making sure infrastructure is available and for free in thousands of areas all around Europe. Today, we will invite on stage representatives from municipalities from across Europe that have successfully applied to benefit from Wi-Fi for EU. Uh, but first, we would like to invite Mr. Roberto Viola, the Director General of DG Connect, to come on stage and tell us more about this Wi-Fi for EU initiative. Mr. Viola, welcome. Welcome, sir. Hi again. <laughs> yes, please so, use the lectern to, to hear, to hear the, the, the ideas uh, uh, behind Wi-Fi for EU. Okay. So, good morning, everybody. And I promise Today I will not use bottles and glasses to explain Wi-Fi for you, as I did yesterday for Quantum, because Wi-Fi for you, in a way, is very simple. It's about giving a support to municipalities that would like to install a Wi-Fi free for every citizen. Uh, free in all sense, so that does not intercept personal data to pay for the infrastructure. It's really offered as a gift to the communities. So you might say, why to do this kind of thing? In the era of 5G, I mean, in the era of hyperconnectivity, you think about Wi-Fi. Well, I mean, it would be like saying, uh, we don't need to distribute uh, water freely in, uh, in cities. Uh, you can buy very nice bottles uh, uh, everywhere. Free Wi-Fi is a little bit like free water. It's the basic connectivity that every community has to have. And there are immense possibilities to do uh, crowdsource projects, to build up communities, exactly what you heard uh, in the previous session. The more we are into this, the more we discover that with Wi-Fi for EU, we can create a gigantic community in Europe. And frankly, when we started this, there was a little bit of skepticism around. Will it be interesting for the municipalities of Europe? My team uh, said maybe, maybe a fraction. When we opened the portal, uh, we were submerged by request. Half, almost half of the municipalities of Europe have applied for the scheme. We are now uh, at something like 5,000 vouchers, which we already awarded, and uh, uh, there will be new calls. So we are creating a very, very large community of citizens that will all be connected uh, uh, freely to the network. And this is the starting point. It's a very important starting point. And what we are now doing, it's really from this starting point to move to the next step, which is to discuss with the friends, with the municipalities that are part of this project, on how to involve the citizens in citizens-led projects in building communities. And of course, planning the next step in the, the next uh, financial framework of the European Union, where probably we will want to continue this model of helping municipalities to grow communities, uh, grow in terms of platforms, maybe looking at 5G, maybe looking at other technologies, but we, the idea to grow a city, a community platform around connectivity. So that's Wi-Fi for you. It's a very simple scheme, but behind there's a very big dream. Thank you very much. And speaking- Thank you very much, sir. Of this big dream, you will make uh, how many, uh, seven, uh, representatives of European regions dream right now possible. Yes, we will seven call out them. of yes. many hundreds, I understand. <laughs> 5,000. Yeah, so I, will, I, will, I have been training on the pronunciation. I will need a little bit of help from me. I, yeah, let us help you, sir. Well, yeah, let us we will call them on stage. <laughs> I, I tested the whole morning. Now, let's, oh, should, then I please, should, then please do you the will honors. soon take our jobs. We thought that robots will take our jobs. Mr. Viola is going to take our job. <laughs> no, 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 you do it. <laughs> All right, so if you All want right. to call them up on we stage. All right, so who, who starts? 
you start. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think uh, it's a very touching moment. Again, out of the hundreds of uh, municipalities that uh, earned this voucher from the European Union, we have the honor to invite uh, on stage uh, today seven of them to receive the vouchers straight from the Director General of DigiConnect. So let's start. Mr. Ovidiu Dumitru Malankravan, Mayor of Sigishwara. The voucher, Thomas, give us the vouchers. The director wants the vouchers. He does want to give it away. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go on. Ms. Arabella Liana Bu, representing Negreshti Orsh. I would like to ask Mr. Malankravan, no, do not leave the stage because we're going to have a family photo at the end. So please, come back on stage, sir. Come back on stage. And also, come with on stage. With your voucher. Yeah, with your voucher, <laughs> definitely. Come on stage also, Mr. Costel Pistrizu, mayor of Vailesht. Please, come on, come on, Mr. Pistrizu. Mr. Catalin Yonel Bugio, representing the mayor of Yashi. All right, Mr. Michael Murphy, representing the Tipperary County Council. Mr. Claudio Popescu, representing Craiova City Hall. And Ms. Cristina Dosulano, representing Braila City Hall. Thank you all. Let's have the family photo maybe, and maybe because Thomas has some more vouchers. This is yes. an ongoing drummer. Program, right? <laughs> <laughs> Do apply. We've got some more. Anybody wants to apply? <laughs> <laughs> and Thank now you the very family much. photo the with Mr. Viola. Are here, not just paper vouchers. Oh, yeah. we are sure about that. <laughs> Mr. Viola, can you go take among a the photo with yeah. All right, thank you, thank you very much to all. And I think we are drawing to the closing. We'll see you in a minute. Thank you, Director.
I think we are uh, closing to a very nice end of Digital Assembly 2019, but we want to hear some special remarks at the end of two very fruitful days, I would say. I invite you to share with us the closing part of this insightful Digital Assembly. So please, welcome on stage. In the name of the Romanian Presidency of the EU Council, Minister of Communications of Romania, Mr. Alexandru Petrescu. Welcome again. <laughs> nice to see you again, sir. Well, what an amazing two days. And uh, we're ever so pleased that you made the time to be here with us. I hope you've been enjoying Bucharest and you've been enjoying the panels and the events. And uh, I have to say, it's been an absolutely amazing journey. And uh, these two days are leaving me with a feeling of a turning point. Definitely a turning point for Romania because the presidency projected to all Romanians the importance of EU presidency. And let me deeply thank you for that. I'm ever so grateful for having Neves and Maria yesterday. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, all my colleagues of European Commission, who they've been amazing. And really, you made all this happening. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. I have to say, it's probably one of the nicest ITNC events I've been, and God knows I've been to many. So absolutely amazing. And uh, it is for Romania, a before and after presidency when we talk about digital agenda. And at the end of the day, you made this happen. So thank you again. Have a lovely afternoon. And uh, I look forward to working with Finland and uh, all the other member states. Thank you very much. Let's accomplish the digital single market. And my personal motto, more clicks, less bricks. Thank you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Congratulations. Thank you. We appreciate it. We are doing Thank more you. clicks from now on. And we have some breaking news about traffic we want to share with you before we continue with the final uh, comments on this amazing digital assembly session. We just want to let you know, those of you who are uh, thinking about going to the airport. The Romanian presidency is organizing a special bus because traffic is very heavy. So we just wanted to put your minds at ease and let you know that there's, uh, there are some accommodations uh, taking, uh, being taken care of for you. Uh, but now we will continue with uh, our closing speeches. I would like to invite to the stage Ms. Kristina Posavic, Deputy Secretary of State of the Central State Office for the Development of the Digital Society of Croatia. Croatia will be taking over the European Union Presidency on uh, Welcome, January 2020. Please. Welcome. Good afternoon to all. Uh, first of all, let me thank you, our Romanian friends, Commission and the Presidency for organizing this lovely event. It was really my pleasure to be here for these two days. We had two days of really fruitful discussions, very interesting panels and very interesting speakers. Also, some key points were made and messages sent. And to my opinion, one of the key messages is that digital is one of the areas where we should work even more united to, to achieve the common goal. And for the end, uh, let me invite you for the next year, Digital Assembly 2020 in Croatia. So welcome all to Zagreb in May 2020. Excellent Thank invitation. You. Thank you. And good luck with that. And the last world of uh, work of Digital Assembly 2019 belongs to Mr. Roberto Viola, the Director General of DigiConnect. Please come back on stage, sir. <laughs> All right. I promise that the last
last time I come back on stage. <laughs> on this stage. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are at the end, uh, as Mr. Petrescu said, and I agree with him, uh, of two amazing days. So, my role now is to just say thank you. Thank you to you all for being here, participating, getting involved, giving us your ideas, your enthusiasm. It was really impressive, and I think we all learned a lot from each other. We launched a few ideas, a few new things, uh, which are very, very important, I think, for Europe and the citizens of Europe. So uh, I would just say now three thank you. The first thank you is to the Romanian presidency for the amazing work they've done, for all the people that work at DIA, and they have done really a very, very impressive work in making sure we could have an amazing two days, a very important program, and everything going so well and so smoothly. So I ask you a big applause for the Romanian presidency. Well done. Now, if you allow me, a second applause I would ask for the European Commission, my colleagues that have been working with the, the Romanian presidency, the colleagues from many different services inside the Commission that helped to make this event a success. They've been working hard since a year, and uh, what you see is a little bit the tip, I wouldn't say of the iceberg, the tip of the mountain, <laughs> and has been really hard work, which we have done with the Romanian friends, with a lot of uh, enthusiasm and a lot of, uh, 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 I, uh, uh, well, it was not simple, let's put it this way, because it's a big event. So I would ask you an applause for the colleagues of the European Commission that helped the Romanian president to make it a success. The third thank you is for Ralitza and Mia. Oh. They've been <laughs> with us the two days. I think they are amazing. I mean, they now are quantum physicists, <laughs> they're experts in sustainability, they know everything. They've been really uh, the engine <laughs> of this event. And I really would thank you too. I must say we couldn't have done it without you and your amazing staff. They've been very supportive, very patient with us, explaining quantum physics and all these complicated issues, and they made it easy for us. Thank you to, to, to you and to your amazing staff. Thank you, sir. And now just go online, book everything in the month of May to be sure you are there, flights, hotels, whatever, and uh, we want to see you all in Zagreb with the friends of the upcoming Pro Croatian presidency, and I'm sure it will be another ama amazing event. See you in one year from now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Viola. Good luck. Thank you, sir. I have to say, uh, Ralitza, that after the, these two days, I'm a digital optimist now, I have to say that. And it's up to us to build a bright digital future for Europe. That's right, and uh, I hope that uh, uh, we've generated a lot of great ideas here at Digital Assembly 2019, which will uh, put Europe in the driving seat of the digital transformation. What else is to be said? Let's uh, get off the stage ourselves. Enough has been said. We are Ralitza Vasileva and Mihai Konstantin, and thank you for being part of Digital Assembly 2019. Great audience. All the best to you.